this is David Booth. Today, we have a series of uh, short uh, sort of lightning talks by uh, various people. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Gaurav Vaitya. Okay. That's the thing. Um, I work at the University of North Carolina, and uh, the, the place where we're using at, at the Renaissance Computing Institute, specifically, and the place where we're using the Cord19 data set is, and the, the thing I'm building from it, is a product called OmniCord. Now, OmniCord is just a small part of a bigger project called Robocop, which stands for Reasoning Over Medical Objects Linked in Knowledge-Oriented Pathways. So this isn't a project that I work with directly. I'm only responsible for the OmniCord part of it. But just to introduce you guys to why we're extracting the Cord19 data, um, Robocop is a project where is a is a database where you can ask, you can frame questions in the form of a graph. So over here we have a graph that says, "Show me genes that have some sort of a relationship with COVID-19." and then show me chemical substances that have some sort of a relationship with gene. And we're getting this sort of interconnection data from a bunch of different sources. Um, the omni-chord part of it is that we're looking through the chord 19 corpus and looking for uh, co-occurrences of the various terms such as COVID-19 with various genes and then with various chemical substances. So Robocop itself is up and available for anyone to play around with. The main Robocop instance is at robocop.renc.org. But we have a special COVID one, which is based on uh, the COD19 data and a bunch of other sources at covid.robocop.renc.org. Um, if you want to use the Robocop interface, that's how you can get access to it. Um, but if you want to access the triple store directly or the graph database, sorry, directly, uh, you can also go to robocopkg.renc.org. So all of these are publicly accessible and uh, a link to the presentation is in the document. Um, so feel free to poke around there if you'd like to. Um, also feel free to interrupt me at any time if you have any questions about anything that I'm saying. So in order to build a stable of correlations uh, of co-occurrences, um, my job is to download a copy of the um, Robocop of, of Cord19, and then to identify ontology terms in, inside of the Cord19 data set. And this is the list of ontologies that we currently use when we're, that we get terms out of. Um, so you'll, you'll see some pretty well-known names on the list. We've got Uberon, we've got Chebby, we've got the cell ontology, we've got the protein ontology. And then we have ontologies like the relation ontology and the spatial ontology which are there to kind of eventually uh, tell us a little more about specifically how these things are related to each other and where uh, spatially they are found relative to each other. Um, and what we do with these ontologies is, first of all, we merge them together in one massive AL ontology, which we can do using the robot tool, which um, if you haven't heard about it, the robot tool does a whole bunch of different AL transformations. So you should totally check this out if you, if you haven't seen it before. But one of the things it can do is given a list of ontologies, it can merge them up together. And then that way we have one massive ontology with all the terms that we want in it. Um, once we have our massive ontology, we use the SciGraph tool to actually do the annotations. So this is an open source tool written in Java, um, which uh, sort of, running it as a three-step process, where first we create a Neo4j database with all the terms from all of these different ontologies that we're interested in. Um, now, one limitation of SciGraph is that only one process can access a, a particular SciGraph database at a time. Um, so we actually just replicate it multiple times on our server so that we have you know, 20 jobs running simultaneously and each one is targeting a different SciGraph instance. And um, then we just, then we run all the incoming COD19 files through SciGraph and identify any, um, on any of those ontology terms. Uh -huh. Given that we're using terms from a whole bunch of different ontologies, we do have a lot of um, terms that are being erroneously matched, where for instance, uh, one, one thing that commonly comes up is that the English word can, C-A-N, gets identified as a kind of, I think a kind of receptor or something. Um, 
The other problem that we've run into with SiteGraph is that the input text is manipulated before the annotation process takes place. So it's a little hard to figure out where the annotation was, what text is actually supposed to be annotated. So that's something we're trying to figure out right now. Um, in, t in terms of, it, it can tell us which annotations are in the text, but we don't have a really good way of figuring out where in the text those annotations actually are. Um, but yeah, that's sort of in a, in a very simple way, that's our workflow. We have the ontologies, which go into a SciGraph database. We have Cord 19, which goes into the annotator. And then the annotator runs each one of the Cord 19 data files through SciGraph and gives us, at the moment, we, it just gives us a tab delimited result file that tells us which term was found in which um, Cord 19 document and where in the document it was found. But uh, the goal here is to eventually have an RDF result file um, or possibly also some, uh, some kind of a format that would allow us to upload it to a annotation uh, data set, uh, annotation repository like the one we saw last week. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. You're kind of out of, kind of, out of time. Um, oh, okay. So if you're at a good spot in Portland, maybe there's Yeah, I can, I can, I can stop here. This is just an example of identified annotations that it's picking out of a one particular document. Uh, questions, anybody? Yes, yeah, here. Uh, I'm Daniel Schwabi from uh, the Catholic University in Rio. Just like to know if the, the tab uh, separated uh, uh, file with the annotation is also available? Uh, no, we don't, we don't have a way of publishing that right now. We're trying to convert it into a format that we could upload to a, a annotation repository. But as of right now, um, the, like we, we process the tab delimited file into a set of co-occurrences. And then that co-occurrence data goes into the Robocop knowledge base that I was showing you right at the start. Right, but the Robocop uh, data itself, well, after that, is it available in some form? Yes, the Robocop data is uh, available on those, if we go way back, uh, the Robocop kg.renci.org oh, yes. sort of yeah. directly accesses the knowledge graph. Um, it's, um, so by the time it gets there, it's pretty much just like, it's, it's not even so much co-occurrence data as much as just relationships. So it'll just tell you that somewhere there's a relationship between this this gene and this thing, but to reduce space, we've, uh, we, we don't have the literature information by that stage. So we are also working on trying to, trying to keep the literature information um, throughout the process, but sort of as a quick and dirty thing right now, we, it, when you go to the knowledge graph, it'll just say, we know that there's some relationship between COVID-19 and this gene, but it won't tell you which paper that relationship comes from, at least okay. not yet. Thank you. Okay, I think we should uh, move on now. Uh, thank you very much, Gaurav. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Golem, I think you're next. Uh, Golem, you you on the line there? Yeah. yeah I think. Okay. <laughs> okay. I need to share the screen. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so you, so can you see my screen? Yes, very good. Okay, okay, so yeah. So uh, actually I'm Golam Rabbi from University of Economics, Prague Czech Republic. And I'm working with Dr. Thomas, maybe, yeah, pre previously I just present uh, this work before in this webinar. So here is our project. Actually, we are currently working. Uh, maybe we are the uh, finishing stage now. Okay, that's, uh, this one is the entity-based document classification for the code 19 corpus. Okay, so mainly for this project, we are doing like we are converted the code 19 data set to a plug CSV file. And from there we are like, uh, finding the success of paper depends on the um, citations. And for these things, we are going to find out the uh, combination of concept, concepts like chemical substance and some other things from the research paper. Okay, for the 
stage of pre-processing data. I just uh, here I show you just one example. Like we are selecting the documents and from the documents we are uh, using size for finding the entity recognition. And from there we are just uh, collect the, all the entities and uh, we are checking again these entities in the concept net. And from there we're using some ranking mechanisms and for the final stage we are making uh, transforming this one in a CHD format file. Okay. So here is the like uh, a, an example that we are finding these entities from the size space like coronavirus, human, human coronavirus, mouse brain, and from these things like for the coronavirus uh, from concept net we also find some um, some Q two nine zero eight zero five or some other things for depends on the coronavirus. And we are also find some of the relations uh, from the concept net, like coronavirus is related to alpha coronavirus and coronavirus is also related to virus and some other things like is related to RNA and like blue pump and some other things. And here is the another one like uh, for this uh, alpha coronavirus is also some, some variants like uh, bad coronavirus in CDP, HE15, another one is bad coronavirus like HKU can okay from these entities we are trying to prepare uh, a bag of concept model with uh, with uh, citations uh, data we are using actually open citations ontology uh, for uh, making this bag of concept model and in this model we have we have the paper uh, DOI or paper name and from there we have uh, finding the uh, finding the entities and also the uh, citations. Okay, so after this uh, making this bag of concept model, we are actually find out some rule uh, or using some uh, rule mining techniques for find uh, using this uh, uh, bag of concept or uh, this CSV file. Like we also find uh, some uh, relation like uh, antigenase and some uh, antitoxic and cold and some DNA and some and some other uh, other relations and we all find this type of things from the open citation ontology those papers are cited uh, 10 to 100 times and for these things i also uh, also uh, told or uh, shared these things that we are finding mostly for research paper uh, from the open citation ontologies are uh, all with the citations hello I yep, sorry, I was muted. You. Okay. Yeah, go okay. ahead. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, in the summary stage, uh, like uh, uh, for the uh, entity recognition, we are uh, kind of using the size space concept net, size space with concept net and PFIDF model. And for the ontologies, I previously shared with you that uh, we are using the open citation ontologies maybe we are preferring some suggestion from from the audience that uh, is there any better better option for us and um, and we are also using the uh, sbrl corels and random forest technique for finding the combination of concept from the research papers and in the future work part currently we are thinking uh, to integrate with the power annotation model previously this this one is present in this webinar maybe three or four weeks ago by one japanese team so we are thinking to integrate this one too with our work and i think it will be uh, give us more accurate results or more better result for the finding the combination of concept from the code 19 uh, this is paper, this is and another another future work part is we are also uh, using the code 19 knowledge graph for finding our, our export rules from this uh, knowledge graph and also there is just like some diagram for the code uh, we are actually uh, finding which things in our future work and this one is the one of the future work demo results. Previously, Dr. Thomas maybe showed this one here, but uh, we are still now this one in the future work process. So yeah, this one is like one example. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Gollum. You're a little over time, uh, but uh, does anybody have a question? I do have one quick question, uh, which is basically. Um, 
So for others who might want to build on your work, what data would they use from your work? Okay, so actually uh, from our work, is it possible to uh, use the bag of concept model? Uh, maybe after finish our experiment, we are open this one. And, and another one is like uh, we are experimentally showing the which, uh, which new entity model or entity recognition technique works better in depends on the code 19 data set. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions for Gollum? Okay, uh, let's go on to uh, Marcin, you're next. Hi, how's it going? Good. Yep, I can hear you. Okay, let's see if I can uh, uh, find the slide screen. I see you actually at the moment. I do, am I supposed to share my slides or? Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. You, yeah, go ahead and share them yourself. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you want, I could share them for you, but the... No, yeah, uh, no, the reason for giving me the slide URL is just so that I could send it out to other people. Sounds good. Let me let me get it here. Yeah. Okay. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Let's see. I don't usually use a preview, so hopefully this will be good enough. How's that? Okay. Yep, <laughs> so, that looks fine. Martin, Thanks. Yeah. Martin Yakimak, I'm a staff researcher at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and today I'll tell you about our KG COVID-19 knowledge graph effort. If I can advance my slides, here we go. Okay, uh, so uh, we are a team of Berkeley Lab researchers and also uh, collaborators from the Monarch Initiative and the uh, Eliminating the Druggable Genome Project. So all those efforts uh, work with knowledge graphs and either tooling around graphs or graph learning applications. And our goal here was to build a lightweight, lightweight framework that could support construction and maintenance of knowledge graphs for COVID-19 and specifically targeting drug repurposing efforts so that's kind of uh, stemming out of our work with the other NIH projects. Um, and on the left here, I'm just showing a uh, figure of the Gordon et al. interactome, so the human host proteins interacting with some viral proteins. So that's one of the example data sets we've ingested. I'll have a little bit more on that coming up. Uh, and our interests are generally around annotating molecular entities, uh, deriving knowledge from literature, and also developing uh, graph learning methods. Uh, okay, so the approach is fairly lightweight. Uh, we have a GitHub repo uh, that I think I didn't post the link here, so I'll share, share that in the chat. Uh, so we have YAML files to indicate what parts of the original source file needs to be ingested. And we use this KGX tool written by Deepak Uni to perform the actual graph, uh, the data uh, merging and graph construction. Our builds are automated. So we have an RDF download that you can access at the link here. And if there's a demand, we can also uh, put things up like a Sparkle endpoint. And so here on the right, I'm showing kind of the process of how this is, is, uh, is happening. So we're both taking existing knowledge graphs and uh, data sets uh, with uh, either some standardization or where we can map to ontologies. And this includes some experimental data. This is kind of nascent work that we're trying to do to bring in data directly from say gene expression experiments annotated with say Go terms, for example. Uh, and then also on the bottom, we're working with another team at LPL uh, that have set up this covidscholar.org uh, website. It's essentially a uh, literature search powered by NLP and makes use of deep learning embeddings. Uh, it's an outgrowth of their Matt, Matt Scholar work. So you're welcome to check out these uh, pretty fancy search functionalities. Uh, they have a pretty nice approach to the corpus. So this extends beyond court 19 and uh, we can tell you more about that later. Uh, and there's also some embedding applications. So I'll show you a little bit about how we can merge on that front as well. But I guess the idea here is that we have multiple streams of information coming into a centralized knowledge graph that you know, standardize with the same identifiers and you can now query and operate on things together. Uh, and this is actually a figure made by Justin Reese. He's also on the call. Uh, so this is kind of a snapshot of where we are with our current uh, data in the knowledge graph. Uh, and you know you can see that the, the ontologies are kind of one central thing here that links across multiple different types of data inputs. Uh, there is, like, as you may know, there are some issues with the actual protein representation of the uh, proteins in this virus. 
because it produces polyproteins that are then cleaved into protein products. Uh, and so that's effectively a prediction step at this stage. Uh, there are also lots of other small mRNAs or larger mRNAs that produce other proteins and, and there's a transcriptome paper but I think in terms of the full protein complement, we're still not quite, quite there yet. So that's kind of one very important piece for centralizing data and having one access. And of course, we're not going to do that, but we'll you know, import uh, whoever takes on this role, like Uniprit, for example. Right? Uh, so on the left, top left here, we have a couple uh, different uh, chemical or drug uh, data databases. So these include direct the gene links. Uh, and you can imagine that this is something we'd like to target for uh, direct the gene uh, predictions for drug repurposing. Uh, and then, of course, another piece here is we're working on a manifest as, as these graphs get built to know, A, what the contexts are, but more importantly, which links are kind of underrepresented, uh, which, can, you know, which types of relationships are under, underrepresented here. So then we can either go out and target those data sets for imports or maybe work with somebody to create that even. <clears throat> Uh, and then finally, just wanted to end with some applications that are downstream of this graph construction. Uh, so we are very interested in graph learning methods, uh, mostly link prediction, but also similarity uh, in search. And so here I'm showing uh, how we are pipeline for this. There's another project uh, now called Embiggen, uh, and that's about developing new graph learning methods, mostly for heterogeneous networks. Those seem to be under, underrepresented methods out there. Uh, and and we can also uh, merge with the, the uh, COVID scholar effort because they also generate embeddings of uh, literature terms of mapped entities and we can combine those embeddings and, you know, and, and increase the predictive power. Uh, so that's kind of another area that's being developed down, downstream of this. Uh, and just in terms of acknowledgements, uh, a few people at LBL, uh, UC Boulder, University of Milan and Jax, kind of the team that has been behind, behind this effort. Um, so yeah, I think I'll take questions, I guess, if people have any. Right on time, thank you. Uh, questions then? Yeah, I have one, sorry, uh, Victor here. So yeah. this, uh, I've taken a look at your really cool data set. It has a lot of stuff. Uh, I mean, you have the whole gene ontology. Yeah, exactly, the whole HPO, everything. Um, yeah. Is it, but not all of this, as far as I understand, not all of this is, uh, let's say, related to the oh. Core 19 data set. So you just import the whole HPO. Uh, it, do you plan on producing kind of a subset, like uh, let's say the subgraph around the entities mentioned in the, or detected by the Cybyte annotations? That, that's, yeah, that's a very interesting question, right? So once you ge generate this giant graph, which in some ways you consider, you know, a kitchen sink approach or, you know, very mixed uh, data repository, Right, so I think uh, we now uh, have ways to, I think, do some cipher queries on this. And so that would be one approach to call it a subgraph. And I, if anyone's interested in working on that together, you know, building the queries, or if you have uses for those graphs, then, you know, please reach out and we'll work with you. That's yeah, a great, great concept. And I guess, you know, for the Core 19 annotations here, these are from Scibytes, and we feel like, you know, those are pretty good. But obviously, you know, there are lots of efforts on that front. And so I think, you know, if there's better data sources or additional sources that could also be attached here. Thanks. Other uh, questions for Marcin? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, maybe a quick one. This is Frank. Um, uh, do you have any uh, uh, any collaboration with, with uh, some medical staff uh, who are uh, aware of what you're doing and, and do they have already figured out uh, some, some questions they would like to ask on, on top of this graph? Uh, so we, we have some through the translator project. Uh, so we're also collaborating with Matt Might at the University of Alabama and they have a team of clinicians. I think that's more of kind of a search application where they know, you know, interesting things and they use this as a query interface in some sense. Uh, but I think, you know, we're open to that. I think, you know, our drug repurposing kind of task is fairly open-ended, right? So it'd be anything that could help in theory. But I think you can break that down into, you know, attacking specific viral proteins versus some aspects of human disease, right? And obviously that, that's a huge problem, right? And we're not going to be able to do all the queries and solve all the problems there. So, you know, we, we are in some sense platform providers and then, you know, any other uses that people come up with or they're very interesting, we can try to help collaborate. Okay. Hi, can you paste the URL of the repository that you said in the chat, please? Sure, yeah, I'll do that. And uh, actually, um, Marcin, if you could also just paste it into the uh, notes document, that would be okay. great. Okay, no problem, yeah, sure. All right, yeah. I'll stop sharing my screen then. Thanks, everyone. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you. Um, let's see, next up is uh, Michael. 
Okay. Well, Michael, you ready to yep. share your screens and stuff? Yep. There we go. All right. So um, I'm going to actually deal with the medical side. I'm not a computer scientist. I'm a modeler trained in theoretical chemistry, but I work in a clinic. And what I'm going to talk about are actual results of work we're doing from the clinic working back. We're working with an international team of people, clinicians. And a lot of the goals we're interested in dealing with are focusing on what are the actual questions in the clinic? Uh, how do we take the literature but identify what gaps are present in the literature and identify uh, and evaluate conflicts that are present in the literature and then look at disparities that come about? So some of the questions you might ask are, how do you determine the actual diagnosis and staging of a patient? Who should go on a ventilator, things of this nature? And then we're working uh, in, with a quantum computing group to apply basically graph analytics, moving it from uh, conventional computing into a quantum computing environment. So this is a model that you might think is fairly straightforward. We've got the literature source, such as the COVID-19 data. We've got NLP and other analytical methods. It's incorporated within a platform that has a knowledge graph, but as I'll show you, it's a top-down functional model knowledge graph. And what I mean by that is we're applying it in all these different areas. And rather than developing that knowledge graph from the data and driving it to application, we're driving the knowledge graph from the needs of the community and building a top-down rather than bottom-up uh, knowledge graph. And what do I mean by that? I mean, we have a functional model that we use. Um, I developed this a number of years ago. We've applied it in about 20 different diseases. This is a generic model of how a patient progresses into and out of a disease. But what we know is in healthcare, there are many different players. Each player has a different perspective on what disease really is. And it's a very limited perspective. So what we've done is focused on building the model and the process of how a patient goes through that process. And we built initially a disease agnostic ontology that allows us to uh, map this immediately to new diseases and also serve as an object-oriented data model. Um, this is just a top layer of what that ontology looks like. We've mapped that now to COVID-19. So we go from a pre-infection individual interacting with the virus as they get infected and tested and treated, then evaluated and post-treatment. Uh, what we start to add are the next layer of details to each of those components. And then fundamentally what I've done is I've broken that up into the critical sections of information and questions about the patient and the virus, signs, symptoms, and diagnosis, treatment and response, and outcome. And to give you an idea then, we work with each of these sections in parallel. This gives you the first explosion of that um, patient and virus section, where we now look at risk assessment, each of the factors in risk assessment, such as social determinants of health, um, environment, genomics, and so on. Um, in terms of the virus, we're obviously looking at strains. We're going beyond strains into the mutation profiles and then geographic distribution. Our epidemiologic friends tend to look at statistics, but we're really trying to drive towards causality. So now if we actually take this and go to the next layer down, you see that while um, we started to mention comorbidities, we really need to look at all of the different classes of comorbidities, those which have been observed and those are, which are general in the population. And then the medications, both which have been evaluated or talked about, but actually the medications that are common in the overall general population as well. And going down even further, while we started off with things like respiratory conditions, we really need to look at the difference at the level in the clinic of an asthmatic patient versus a patient with COPD, different types of cardiovascular events, and then the medications that are applied to that. But that goes even more deeply um, because when we're looking at comorbidities, one of the things we have to be concerned about is 
this is a, a mathematical model that we've developed for analyzing disease, where we treat disease as a uh, process over time, where different points in time lead to different diagnoses. So we need to know how to define that vector in high dimensional space, how far along that vector a patient is, and then how quickly they're progressing. But then the disruption that you get from either a comorbidity or a drug that's being taken can be at any level, either the process or response to diagnosis and treatment. And so one of the things we're looking at are patterns of comorbidities as well. And not only are they patterns of which comorbidities may exist in, in pairs, but which were active, which ones preceded, which ones, uh, so that we know how they're linked at a causal level and what that impact is uh, on the patient. About out of time. Yeah, and oh, look at that! Perfect timing. <laughs> so that that's uh, that that's sort of a quick and dirty overview. Great uh, questions for Michael. Hey, Michael! I thought that was very interesting. Uh, my name is John Baglin. I'm at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, so, is this, uh, I guess, this graph of comorbidities and uh, the stuff that you're working on available anywhere? That we can um, look not into right now. I mean, we we've been developing our you know collaborative group and and working backwards. Um, so we're extending it right now, and be happy to talk to you further about that. Okay, I, I snapshotted your email. I'll send you an email. Okay. It's Martin. I was curious. Do you think we're going to see, I guess, some either new diseases or maybe some early stages of known diseases right through? Uh, you know, I guess the virus is kind of an assay here. Well, well, actually, what we're using it for is to change the diagnostic characteristics. What's being used to actually diagnose and triage a patient. So the characteristics that they've been using of mild, moderate, and severe aren't adequate because they're a snapshot. And uh, they don't tell clinician how to anticipate where that patient may be headed and how to manage them. So now that we have more data, we're able to actually map that back and refine those. And then also use it for surveillance and look at different risk groups. Um, okay. Ian, a yeah, quick ahead. one. This is Frank. Uh, Thanks, Michael. Very interesting presentation. I was wondering uh, more technically, maybe uh, how you uh, come up with this graph of uh, comorbidities, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I've not followed from the beginning very well, but what was the whole processing to come up with this connection of comorbidities and all? Well, what we're looking at are, uh, it's a very generalized model because the approach we use we've used in about 20 other diseases. And so what we've learned from looking at all the diseases, it, tend, it continues to build on the knowledge graph. And so we're looking not just at diseases that people have singled out for specific studies, which would be a specific paper, but we're looking at other conditions uh, in general that people haven't even asked about that may uh, impact how a patient progresses or is susceptible to the disease. And so that is an ongoing, it's a learning system that continues to evolve. Okay. So, so how, how is it so, somehow connected to the COVID-19 papers? So now what we're doing is we're processing the, the, those papers and populating the graph to see um, if, if two papers are, are, are looking at a graph, or rather the paper, um, I, I have a pharma background in part, and one of the things that we know is clinical trials and the inclusion exclusion criteria are extremely sparse in defining what a real world patient is. And so this enables us to very quickly identify where there's gaps in the data relevant, but missing from the paper, or if there's conflicts between two papers, two studies, what factors might have been included in one that were not in the other. And so how do you actually evaluate that? Okay, and, and do you do that on, on, by just detecting keywords in the, in the papers, or is it no, really no, no. about it's detecting the arguments process. that are being stated? Yeah, there, it's a full text processing of the papers. Uh -huh. As I mentioned last week, we're not doing the abstracts, we're doing the papers. Yeah, okay, okay. Great job. Okay, so full text NLP then. Yeah. Okay, good, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks very much, Michael. 
so let's see. Uh, Tom, uh, Tom Conlon, are you on the call? And I don't know if you are going to be presenting or one of your colleagues. Um, is somebody on for Tom? Not hearing response there. I believe that Tom tried to uh, push his presentation forward in time, but let me run. Oh, for so so you were basically covering for his. No, 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 uh, no. But we do collaborate. But uh, I think Tom was just he wanted to do it a little later. I think he. That was, oh, I see. Okay, got you. Now I understand. Sorry. Okay, yeah, so I'll, I can reschedule that for a, a different week then. Okay, fine. All right, so I think I'm up next then uh, with uh, Daniel Stone. Daniel, are you on the call too? Let's see. I think I heard you say something, yeah. Okay, great. So I will start off, I'll, I'll just do my, um, I'll go through my slides first. And then Daniel will help out with uh, answering questions. So let's see here. Got to get the slides. Here we are. And where's the sharing? Okay. Okay. All right. So you should see my screen now. What a mess. Okay. <laughs> uh, let me get this. Too many things going here. All right. And slide. No. I forget how you go. What is it? F5 or something? Oh, well, this is top gonna... right. Top right white button. Top right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. So this is um, this work on the Core 19 database is. Uh, part of a, a larger project that is a collaboration between the Mayo Clinic and Johns Hopkins University. And it's really being led by Gojan Jang and Harold Solbrig, uh, but I've been helping out on it. Um, and Daniel Stone is also a member of the, of the project and he's on the call as well. Um, so basically, well, you know what the CORD19 database is. Uh, this, these slides I, I'm repurposing from something else. Um, so I'm gonna skip over a little bit. What we've been working on has involved the HL7 FHIR representation. This is a, a, a data exchange format and protocol uh, put out by the HL7 organization for electronic health records. And specifically, uh, for the past few years, we've been working on an RDF representation of the FHIR standard. And so FHIR RDF has been kind of the hammer that we've been using for a while. So when the CORD19 database came out, uh, we said, hey, let's put it into uh, the FHIR RDF representation and see if that's useful to people. Uh, so here's a page on the, the RDF representation of FHIR there. Um, let's see. And, and uh, Harold Solbrig, by the way, if you're interested in FHIR RDF, did a really nice uh, tutorial that we turned into a, um, well, pretty, pretty well worked out tutorial that's on the Yosemite Project website. So if you wanna try out an example of Fire RDF, this was done before the CORD19 came out. Uh, so it doesn't use CORD19, but it does show you a bit about the purpose of Fire RDF and how it can be semantically joined with uh, uh, the SNOMED CT uh, terminologies, for example. Uh, let's see, that's just a little bit about that. Okay, so what we did on the CORD19 database was we applied some uh, uh, entity extraction and pulled out medications, uh, conditions, and procedures. Uh, these numbers are probably old numbers. We've probably got more than that now. Um, and then put them into FHIR resource, put them into the FHIR format, uh, the various um, parts of FHIR uh, are known as resources, and each one has its own little schema. The, the one that we used for representing these semantic annotations is called the composition resource. And here is an example of it that kind of shows the schema of it. 
uh, you'll notice that it has a section and within that section there's various things, a code, uh, text, and then down here are some references. So that's where the references are, that's where we stuck the semantic annotations. The second thing that we did was we ran the Core 19 database through the Pubtator Central also in order to pull out uh, things like genes, disease, chemicals, species, whatever, whatever it pulled out. And again, put that into the Fire RDF representation. Uh, and then finally, uh, we also uh, used uh, lit COVID, and Daniel can probably answer more on that, I hope, if there's questions about that, to again pull out things like species, disease, chemicals, genes, etc. And again, all these things we stuck into the Fire RDF format. And we're also collaborating with some others on the um, uh, evidence, EBA, EBM on fire, which stands for Evidence-Based Medicine on Fire. Okay, and I'm out of time here. Uh, so all this work is available on GitHub. There's the URL. Um, oh, and there's a little advertisement for this call. So uh, questions then. Questions, anybody? So, yeah, David, yes. this is Frank. Uh, I, I'm not so familiar with the uh, Fire um, uh, HL7 and Fire model. H how are all they used? Are, are there some specific applications that are ready to exploit this kind of data? How, how does it work? The, uh, so the Fire is oriented toward electronic health records, so clinical data. Um, and that's the main thing to keep in mind about it. So it's very different than, for example, uh, you know, any of the obo, uh, obo foundry ontology-based uh, representations. Mm -hmm. it, 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 uh, it arose from um, healthcare organizations that had been previously using older, well, typically uh, HL7 version 2 or whatever representations for exchanging data, and they wanted to make it more modern. Um, so I don't know if that, does that help answer your question? Well, I, I was wondering what, what, are, uh, what are the things you can do with the, the data once it is uh, translated into that file format? Oh, okay, what can you do with it? Uh, the main motivation I think for using it in the file format or putting it in the file format would be to join it with other electronic health records that are already in fire. Okay, yeah. yeah. So that would all be right, the main right. motivation, yeah. So, so the idea is really to, to get to, uh, um, clinical centers and join these data with their own records of uh, patients that have been uh, affected by the COVID-19 and see uh, if, if we can figure out things from that? That's yeah, that, that's, that's certainly one, one thing that could be done. Yeah, yeah. All right. Or, for example, looking at, at patients and seeing what, uh, what literature might be relevant to particular cases, particular patient cases. Okay, okay. Yeah. Right. So, but we're not entirely sure what people will do with it or whether it's yes. even useful. So we're looking for feedback too. So it is being used uh, by at least one project in the Mayo Clinic, hmm. uh, separate project. Yeah. Other questions? I have a question. So uh, other than the compatibility with the electron health record, does, uh, is it because, uh, I mean, your, your, your file can help you sort of better uh, annotate the, the core data, sort of all, all information in the code can be sort of uh, all, convert to all, all RDF easily using file. Yeah, I mean, Fire is not Fire does not have anything in particular in it that is particularly well suited for representing the Cord nineteen data. In some sense, putting connecting the Cord nineteen data into Fire was a little bit of a retrofit, okay? Um, because the orientation is completely different, right? I mean, Fire is oriented toward electronic health records. Cord nineteen is about literature. Um, but so really it's, it's just a way to get them connected so that if you are working with other fire data, then you have some means of getting, you know, having links into this, uh, 
this uh, COVID nineteen literature. Does that help answer your question? Yes, yes. So, so, so for follow up that, so, so for, uh, the, the, this question is follow for the group here. So, o other than the the file, is any other way we can sort of uh, audio uh, audio analyze the the, the the core data? I mean, use other ontology or some other approach. So that's a question for the group, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. First of the group. Yeah, Sorry, so could you repeat that? Okay, if I Sorry. understood correctly, the question was if there are other ontologies or something in which we can use to represent annotations or entities found in the core 19 data. Was that? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, so, okay, I can answer from our side. We have developed, a, let's say, a very small ontology for this. Uh, but to be honest, we have found that uh, it's uh, insufficient. And uh, if one lesson we have learned is let's use ontologies which are already there. And for this, uh, I just want to mention the existence of NIF. So it's called um, NLP interchange format. So it's a simple ontology that contains classes like document, section, uh, annotation, and the annotations can be put with offsets and so on. So this would be my suggestion and we're actually migrating our annotations into NIF because this is kind of uh, uh, covers all that we have and I by exploring for example the fire uh, core data set I think it could also be converted into this if need be. If need be. And I will add also that, that there are other uh, ontologies being used for example the provenance ontology PROVO mm -hmm. I noticed is being used by at least one, maybe maybe multiple groups. Yeah, if I can just say a word about the, the presentation I made last week. So basically, uh, we have to, to represent the metadata of the article, we used classical ontologies like uh, Fabio or FRBR, Bebo, things like that. that but then to uh, describe specifically the annotations, the named entities, we describe those as annotations using the, using the web annotation ontology plus uh, Provo to uh, track back the annotations uh, to uh, the specific part of the article where uh, named entities were identified and disambiguated, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. and, and we are also... Uh, We've just published an, another part of the data set, which is more about arguments. So here we use, uh, wait a sec, I don't remember the names of the ontologies. If you give me just a sec, I want to tell you that. Um, so while you're looking for that, um, I also want to, since we're almost out of time here, I want to raise another question. The broader question is about how folks in this group would like to go forward. Uh, my current plan so far is to, uh, like next week, for example, have uh, probably two or three other short talks, five minute talks for people that weren't able to do it uh, today. Uh, but also, uh, I'd like to, again, continue with longer presentations. Uh, so that's my thought so far, but I really want to get ideas from uh, anyone on this call about what's gonna be the best way for us to go forward to encourage collaboration between you all. And by the way, I put a message in the chat. If you haven't already put your name and uh, email address at the top of the notes document, please do that so that uh, people can contact each other individually as well uh, there. And uh, let's see, Frank, you were about to say something about an ontology. Yeah, so three ontologies, just to mention that. Uh, we've used the argument interchange format, argument model ontology, and the SIOC argumentation module. So these are to uh, describe what are the arguments that, are, that is claimed and evidences that are extracted from the articles and relate them. That is what uh, evidence supports or attacks a claim, things like that. That's it. Okay, maybe you could put those into the notes. Uh Sure. Oh, sorry. That was that was Frank saying. Sorry. Yes. Sorry, Frank. <laughs> the wrong name here. Um, so back to my question about uh, what, in terms of going forward, uh, what ideas do folks have in terms of uh, how you'd like to go forward on this and and help encourage collaboration? What would be most useful to people? Any. Um, 
Well, like, so I think, you know, these presentations are great because we're learning about our data and our methods, right? And so like, I think we're slowly working to in your document to almost like a catalog there. And I think you know, maybe organically some uh, connections will happen, right? But, but I, I'm actually wondering if people are interested in some more federated approach, I guess. Yeah, good question. So one thing that our team is interested in is uh, building against the needs of the other groups as well. Um, so if we can make our data more accessible to people or uh, prioritize getting things that uh, other groups could, could benefit from. Um, so hearing what everybody's working on and then maybe even just a little bit of a, um, an ask from the community session uh, would be nice. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, excellent, John. You know, and I guess someone was asking me about, you know, kind of clinically relevant questions. So I guess a collection of those that we can play with, right, on the different systems or tools, maybe that's another path here. One question. Yeah, I, would like I second to... that, yeah, uh, having uh, some sort of uh, use cases, something like that, typical tasks that have to be supported in which, uh, which could probably lead to different uh, sets of questions or, or explorations that people typically do. So what Michael showed this is really interesting because it sort of shows how how users, uh, doctors, and so think, and what kind of things they can uh, use when they have such data available. Yeah, I thought that was quite interesting too. Seeing, seeing Michael's uh, comments about that. So Daniel, you're suggesting that we collect like a list of use cases or something? Well, yeah, I'm just seconding uh, Marcin's uh, suggestion already. Yeah, good. Other comments or, th or thoughts or ideas? Yeah, this is Frank. Maybe just just one comment or suggestion. Uh, we've seen that quite quite a lot of the projects presented in here uh, are doing somehow the same thing, probably in their, in different ways and all. That that also questions the 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 problem of reusability of the data that's that's produced, and it's it's uh, really about very pragmatic things like uh, proper documentation. Uh, to to make it possible for people to reuse the data to you know grasp what's in there and how it's modeled and everything because that's often it's not conceptual it's purely technical but sometimes technical when technically when it's not properly defined and described well it makes it pretty hard to reuse so th that's one aspect uh, we're trying to focus on too yeah, and I know that when when stuff is just being built for the first time and it's early on in the project, the documentation may not be there yet. Uh, and, and this is actually specifically one of the reasons why I wanted people to get together and get to know each other uh, so that they could actually reach out individually and overcome those burdens, th those uh, barriers of like lack of proper documentation yet. And about the question you was you was raising at the beginning, uh, to, uh, as to know whether we should have short presentations like this format or longer presentation, I really believe long presentations are very useful because in five minutes it's very it's often very hard to really grasp the content and the challenges, and and we need much more time to do that. Sounds good. Okay, so my plan at the moment is to, is actually to do a mixture. So. Uh, short ones to do a very brief um, introduction to what they're doing and then longer ones as well. So I'm hoping that next week we will get into uh, probably one or two short ones and, and one long one. Okay, great. And do we have a volunteer for next week, by the way? Um, or you can, you can email me. Okay. I, I wanted to add something. Yeah. Um, so um, I, obviously interact directly with clinicians. And um, they find it interesting that people are, are, are sort of collating, collecting, trying to process the data or the papers that are being published. Um, their general response is it's meaningless to them because they don't know how to take advantage of that, not because they need an interface, 
but because they need to have the data evaluated because there's gaps and conflicts, which is why we're emphasizing analysis methods to give us access to that. And so they need to know that if they have a patient and there's a paper that's public and there's three papers published that tell them to do different things, how do they compare and contrast those papers? And what they really need is something that allows them to see what the gaps are or where the conflicts are coming from, if that makes sense. So they can't operationalize 10,000 papers. They're obviously not reading the papers. And for the most part, um, they, they don't find them useful, to be honest with you. So uh, I think that number is 40,000. 40, <laughs> it's 40,000 or more. Yeah, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm saying so. Even worse. <laughs> it's worse. Yes, uh, right. But, but, the, but that's the point. They don't know how to deal with that. And so what they basically do is they don't. Right. And so, yep. so it really, and, and that's why we're focused on what are the questions they have and how can we map those questions into the, what we can provide rather than just apply the technology and expect it to become useful. So right. what, are the, what are the sources of information that they are using? Because I assume they are sharing information somehow. Um, is it Twitter or Point to else? point, point to point. Mm -hmm. You know, they know who they trust. They know who has experience. And, um, you know, they may re refer them to a specific paper, but that doesn't mean they'll read it. Well, thanks. Yeah, that's a really good question. I, you know what, I guess for the, cl the clinicians maybe a question that we would like to know is how do they process new information, right? So you mentioned the experience, so that's one piece, I guess, right? But for a new disease with new symptoms, right? How do they collect that or how do they enrich themselves? I guess? Well, and that's why we build in actually the, pr the practice of medicine in the real world. You know, it, it, for instance, um, I just gave grand rounds at Georgetown on uh, the problems of dealing with real world data. And the example that I use is um, every EHR has your blood pressure in it, but there's 20 different ways to measure your blood pressure and they don't give you the same answer. And none of them tell you how they were measured. Yeah, so ultimately you're talking about uh, a reputation and a trust chain between both uh, uh, clinicians involved, right, by reference, and ultimately also um, validating certain procedures so that they, they understand that, uh, say, uh, pressure was measured according to a certain process or way that they are that they trust, then they'll take that information, otherwise they won't. Uh, well, yeah, uh, and, and even the AMA has done experiments where they've issued protocols for the physicians to follow, and they found that the physicians don't necessarily follow them because they go against the way they usually practice medicine. <laughs> that is fascinating. So, okay. so that's the real world you have to deal with on the other side. Yeah, that's that's great. I mean, that's what we need to do. Yeah, that's the world I live in. Trying to figure that one out. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, excellent. Well, uh, we're pretty much out of time. I think those are some good closing questions, and and I I also would like people to think about maybe bringing in use cases that they can discuss uh, from cl clinicians. Because that needs to, as Michael's pointed out, that needs to drive this work, right? We need to be able to help those clinicians. Okay, um, we are out of time. Uh, any final comments before we close? Okay, and again, if you didn't get your name and uh, email address at the top of the notes document, please do that. Uh, all right, thank you very much. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks, Thanks David. Thank you all. Okay. Bye. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Bye -bye.